Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this week into the video, we're going to be discussing analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel and its discrete GPU design. You might recall that Intel released a whole bunch of slides a few days ago, which many immediately assumed was going to be forming the basis of its discrete GPUs, because it showed things such as power distribution, uh, clock gating, frequency control, and a whole bunch of other stuff. No, says Intel, this is not the case, and it's merely a theoretical idea. We'll get to that in a moment. Then we'll move over to another piece of Intel news, and that is security patches for the 6th, 7th, and 8th generation of Intel processors has been released, and this is, of course, a Spectre and Meltdown. And then we're going to finish the video with AMD and the Epic 3000 and the Ryzen V1000 embedded processors, which the company have just launched, and they look pretty gosh darn spiffy, my friends. But, as I said, we'll start things out with Intel and its discrete GPU. So, a quick piece of backstory, in case you missed it. Intel at the IEEE, International Solid State Circuits Conference, bloody hell, that's a mouthful, decided to show us some slides and discuss briefly a rather impressive looking design. It clocked in at 1.54 billion transistors and was a GPU which was built on the 14NM process. The foundation for this was Intel's own Generation 9 graphics. Now, there are a lot of stuff that we could discuss about this. The voltage ran at 0.51 for 50 megahertz up to 1.2 for 400 megahertz. It measured 8 by 8 mm squared for the test chip die area, but ultimately it was a prototype. So performance was not necessarily where we were excited. Instead, we saw it as more a proof of concept, perhaps an indication that Intel, at least for Arctic Sound, which is of course the first GPU that Raja Kodori is going to be having his hand in, I suppose, might indeed be, I suppose, an escalation of their current architecture, perhaps tweaked and whatever else, and that was going to form not necessarily the basis, but the principles perhaps was going to be very similar. Think of it not necessarily as the design, but more about the architectural features that we might see for this particular uh, graphics chip. And once again, it's most likely for this particular design, because we see an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array, it was most likely going to be targeting workstations and servers, but once again, because it was such an early prototype, you could make the assumption that maybe it would also be used for gaming. Well anyway, throw all that away, because not so much because Intel have released a very short statement. Your hopes, your dreams, you can stomp them into the ground, because Intel released a very short statement, and it said, while we intend to compete in graphics products in the future, this research paper is unrelated. Our goal with this research is to explore a possible future circuit techniques that may improve the power and performance of Intel products, end quote. So what does this mean? Well, there's good and there's bad news. My theory was, that if it was based upon a similar design to what we currently see from Intel, the ninth generation or 9.5 generation or whatever, it's possible that obviously there would be quite a lot of changes, but in essence there would be some semblance of the current architecture still in place. So in, in essence the Arctic sounds would, I don't like to use this term, but it would almost be like a test bed for Intel to scale up to the discrete graphics solution. And I was thinking it was possibly a little, I don't want to use the word uh, safe, but it felt a bit like kind of a small step, but I guess when you're quite literally building a GPU from scratch, Intel does have an awful lot of technology and performance options there. So depending on how much they ramped up the rest of the execution units, how much they ramped up the clock speeds and so on and so on, and how much they changed the design, it could still be a fairly compelling GPU. Well, now it looks like this is not the case at all, and I'm not going to say the design that they're working on is from scratch. After all, we don't really know, other than perhaps Raja Kodori and a few of his staff. But what we can tell you is that this design, this is not going to be... Well, it's just a theoretical concept. Now, with that said, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these circuit techniques are going to be there, and you can certainly see some of the, um, what's the word, knowledge that they've, that they've gained from CPU production 
on how fine-grained the controls are for voltages across the various execution units and so I wouldn't be surprised if some of that or perhaps an advanced version of it does make its way into Arctic or perhaps Jupiter sounds but for now no. Next up some good news from Intel and that is that the updated firmware is now available for the 6th, 7th and 8th generation Intel Core processors, Xeon scalable processors and more. This is an official release in Intel's newsroom by Navin Shinoi. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And according to Navin, I'm going to quote this verbatim, over the past several weeks we've been developing and validating updated microcode solutions to protect Intel customers against security exploits disclosed by Google Project Zero. I'm sure he wrote that through gritted teeth. This effort has included extensive testing by customers and industry partners to ensure the updated versions are ready for production. On behalf of Intel, I thank each and every one of our customers and partners for the hard work and partnership throughout this process. End quote. Now, don't forget that these patches had been available about a month ago. Unfortunately, they had a few issues, by which I mean that they were causing random reboots. So now, what does this mean? Well, once again, there is a plethora of different processors which will be affected by this. And this means that if you have a 6th generation processor or later, so let's say a Skylake or later, if you've got an Intel uh, Scalable, if you've got a Xeon D, if you've got a Core X, so for example, let's say you've got a Skylake X processor, then these patches are for you, my friends. Of course, you will in get slightly impacted with a performance hit, but honestly... I'd rather the performance hit, but that's just my opinion. You're, of course, free to do whatever you wish with your system, especially perhaps if it's just gaming and ultimately you don't give a crap that much about, you know, reformatting your system drive and you've got nothing on it, it's just a pure gaming rig. Then maybe I could see your logic in not installing this, but once again, that's down to you and how you feel you want your network to behave. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, that this will work across a myriad of different processors and currently there is also validation awaiting Broadwell, Haswell, Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge but, and this is the critical thing, now the OEMs so that would be motherboard manufacturers and obviously OEMs such as Dell's and HP's of the world actually have this BIOS file and now that they have the basis of it they can start tweaking it and then releasing it for their specific motherboards so that's really where it comes down to. So in short, normal thing, update Windows, check your BIOSes uh, to see if there's later versions over the next couple of weeks, and hope for the best. Next up, AMD are at it again, in a good way. They have released a myriad of different Epic 3000 and Ryzen V1000 embedded processors. I'll read out the press release first, at least a short snippet of it. Today we extend the high-performance x86 Zen architecture from PCs, laptops and data centers to networking, storage and industrial solutions with the AMD embedded and AMD Ryzen embedded product families, deliver, delivering transformative performance to the core, to the edge, from the core to the edge, said Scott Ayler. Uh, and he is the Vice President and General Manager of the Data Center Embedded Network Solutions Business Group at AMD. AMD Epic Embedded 3000 raises the bar in performance for next generation network functions, virtualization, software defined networking and network storage solutions. So applications, excuse me, not solutions. AMD Ryzen embedded V1000 brings together the Zen core architecture and the Vega graphics architecture to deliver brilliant graphics in a single chip solution and provide space and power saving for medical imaging, gaming and industrial systems. With these high-performance products, AMD is ushering in a new age for the embedded processor. And, of course, multiple different partners have already announced their system. Uh, there is a ultra-performance MyLab EXP ultrasound system, and that's for medical imaging, that's for women's healthcare, cardiovascular, that type of thing. And that's going to use a Ryzen embedded V1000. It's going to be released in Q3. There's also a casino gaming platform, and that's also based on the embedded V1000. And there's four products for Invantech, and that's also based on the embedded V1000. And that's also for casino gaming platforms and multimedia gaming engine, and also automotive um, and gaming applications, as well as medical. So let's go through a few of the specifications. Well, the Ryzen embedded series. In terms of, and I'm of course being kind of rough here, but in terms of the maximum performance, it's roughly kind of similar to a Threadripper 
1950X, but the boost frequency is a little lower. So you're looking at 16 Zen cores. That's, of course, 32 threads, up to 32 megabytes long of recache. Obviously, there's different models, which we'll go through in just a second. A max boost frequency of 3.1, four memory channels, 64 PCIe lanes, up to 8 times 10 GBE uh, connections for um, ridiculous throughput in terms of um, networking, 16 SATA or NVMe drives, integrated SOC, so the chipset is basically built directly into the embedded processor, and it also has SME SEV, which we've discussed multiple times before. It's AMD's uh, secure memory encryption and also uh, encryption virtualization. So in essence, you won't need to make changes at the application level. This will basically mean, for example, in the case of the SEV, that one, say, virtual machine can't access data from another virtual machine, which to a degree anyway makes things a lot securer, and in theory will reduce the chance of, let's say, if you have uh, machine A, which has been maliciously infected, or perhaps the user is just malicious, they won't be able to access data, do snoops or whatever on the data that's in, let's say, system B. AMD are touting that this is going to be between 30 and 100 watts. So this is very scalable. After all, it has four cores to 16 cores. And don't forget, AMD are telling us that the product availability is for up to 10 years. So they say that there's life cycle support. They've got a long life cycle support guarantee with this. So what about the V1000 APU? Well, four cores, eight threads. So 3.6 TFLOP, so it has 11 GPU compute units, four 4K display, so it's got an awful lot of display potential, 4K 60 FPS on decode and encode, dual 10 GE, so once again it has a pretty decent amount of bandwidth, it also has SME, SEV, and in terms of power consumption it's only 12 to 54 watts. They claim that it can deliver up to 200% more performance compared to the previous generations that AMD offered. And honestly, it looks fairly impressive. Even the dual channel memory supports up to 3200 MTS. I'm certainly not going to read all of the specifications because I'll be here for way, 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 way too long. But I will read out a couple of them. For example, the, uh, let's start with the embedded 3000 series. So the 3101, which is the lower end of the SKUs, it only has four cores, no SMT, so four threads, TDP of 35 watts, base frequency of 2.1, uh, uh, boost clock on all cores of 2.9. Uh, actually, if possibly that's not all cores, actually. It looks like that that's just perhaps just a single core. Um, and level 3 cache of 8 megabytes, dual channel, and 266, uh, 2666. Uh, clock frequency on the memory and 32 PCIe lanes and then the higher end which is the 3451 so that's currently the the, uh, the highest end SKU 16 cores 32 threads 100 watt TDP 2.15 for the base clock all cores turbo to 2.45 the boost clock is 3 gigahertz 32 megabytes level free cache 4 channel DDR RAM 2666 in the max clock speed frequency for the RAM and 64 PCIe lanes. And if we were to look at the embedded SKUs, this is for the V1000, the V1202B. Not exactly rolling off your tongue, is it? Let's just be honest. But anyway, TDP range of between 12 and 25 watts. Two cores, four threads. It has three GPU compute, cus uh, compute clusters. Um, or compute units, actually, that's, that's a great term, really, isn't it? Four display support, one megabyte level two cache, and 2400 megahertz for DDR4 support. And the max uh, clock frequency is 3.2. The GPU runs at uh, one gigahertz. And the higher end one is the V1807B, and that is up to 54 watts. Four cores, eight threads, 11 uh, compute units, Four displays, two megabytes level two cache. Uh, once again, shares the same package that so all of these are FP5. 3200 megahertz on the RAM. This actually might make quite a bit of difference because obviously the RAM is also feeding the GPU as well. And the base frequency here is up to uh, 
3.35 gigahertz the turbo is up to 3.8 and the clock speed is 1.3 so honestly for the gpu frequency that's pretty damn impressive with all of that said hopefully you have enjoyed the video i'll see you soon take care bye for now